morning and welcome to Bangalore. In fact, uh, it was a fantastic kickoff by Dr. Manoj, where he beautifully depicted the normal anatomy from a surgeon's perspective. And as he rightly said, it's an extremely complex anatomy when you look at the temporal bones, because the orientation of the temporal bones itself is so different. So, today what we will be doing is, over the next half an hour, I will be doing, trying to take you on a journey of a radiological roadmap for auditory and mid ear anomalies. So just about the history here, the standard examination, as Dr. Manoj said, and even as Dr. Dhanraj initially put it, it was just an X-ray which was done. And the X-ray, always the radiologists look at two planes. One, is, one was an AP, the other was lateral. And then came the advances in terms of Stenver's view and also the partial view, where you were imaging along the petrous temporal or perpendicular to it. But what brought about the change here was the invention of CT and MR. We have worked on CTs where the sections were taking 9 seconds and the maximum thickness was 8 millimeters. So in one section, I think one third of your temporal bone is gone. You cannot identify any structure. So the, with the advances of multi-detector CT, what is multi-detector? It is also called as the multi-slice CT. And what we have is a 64 slice, which gives you a sub-millimeter section, extremely important. What sections we get is in the range of 0.2 to 0.3 mm. Okay, and this section is mandatory when we look at temporal bones, because the structures are extremely small. And the second part is the MR. Great advances in MR, or magnetic resonance also, have brought us to an arena where we can really look at temporal bone very, very closely, and thus transforming a radiologist into a clinical radiologist. And we do interact. In fact, a lot of ENT surgeons, a lot of friends of mine here, we all have an interaction. And in fact, if you can understand Kannada, it is like, halu jenu vandada hage, namma nimma bandana. I tell you, it is so closely knit, radiology and ENT, where one cannot stay without the other. So having said that, let us go on with the talk proper. Request your kind attention for the next 25 minutes. So this is the magnets we have. We have a 3 Tesla as well as a 1.5 Tesla magnet. And this is a multi-detector or a multi-slice CT. It's a 64 slice CT. The biggest advantages of multi-detector CT is you can do a high resolution CT, especially for the bone. You can take a sub millimeter section and you can use contrast for tumors. But as Dr. Manoj aptly put it, there is a problem with CT in terms of evaluation of the soft tissue, more so the cranial nerves. You can look at the canals very well because they're all cortical bone, but when it comes to soft tissue, your resolution is extremely poor. So it's a big no for CT. MR also gives you a sub-millimeter section and the soft tissue resolution is amazing on MR. But you cannot look at the cortical bone because remember, especially the postgraduates, our MR can look at only protons. Your cortical bone is more calcium, so MR cannot look at calcium. So cancellous bone, it's good for MR. Cortical bone is good for CT. Evaluation of nerves, MR, MR, and MR, no CT. And you can also go ahead and do an MR angiography and MR venography. What are the contraindications for MR pacemakers? We do a lot of uh, MR for children who need to undergo a cochlear implant. So these children's parents may have a pacemaker. Please, you as ENT people, when you send a child, also ensure the parents, the grandparents do not have a pacemaker. Because we cannot put a patient in a magnet, nor an attendant can enter the MR room who has a pacemaker. 
The second thing is a cochlear implant. We cannot do an MR when there is a cochlear implant. And third is a neurostimulator where we cannot take these patients in for MR. And as I already told you, MR is extremely poor for cortical bone. Let us look at a few anomalies. And what I have done here is I've tried to put up a normal also for you to compare how a normal looks like. And during the course of the lecture, I shall give you a lot of take home messages. And you as postgraduates, I think if you go through these and religiously spend five minutes every day on the temporal bone, you're all welcome. We will show you how to image the temporal bone, how to look at the structures within the temporal bone. Spend five minutes every day. And in one month, I tell you, you would have mastered temporal bones. So let us look at this here. This is the normal below. And as Manoj rightly said, we call this as the ice cream cone appearance. You have the malleus anteriorly, incus posteriorly, the incudomalleolar joint, classical ice cream cone appearance. And this black line or the hypodens line is the joint, incudomalleolar joint. But what has happened here? The whole anatomy is lost. You don't see the ice cream cone appearance. You don't see the incudomalleolar joint. You just see fusion of the incus and malleus. This is the cochlea. I'll just talk to you as we go into the inner ear. Beautifully seen all the turns of the cochlea. So this is the middle ear. And when you see the incus, the ice cream cone appearance, it is within the epitympanum. If you see, actually, uh, ice cream cone appearance, you know you are in the epitympanum. Because the moment you come down into the mesotympanum, you don't see the ice cream cone appearance. You just see two dots or two lines. Two dots, two lines is mesotympanum. Ice cream cone is epitympanum. And hypotympanum is empty. You do not see any structure except air within the hypotympanum. Let us look at one more illustration. This is pretty rare here. The fixation of the malleus, or you call it as a malleal fixation, or there could be a malleal bar, where you should normally see air within the epitympanic recess above the malleus. Let us just go back for your understanding. Look at this. There should be air above the malleus in the epitympanum. But here, you have the malleus moving up and getting fixed to the epitympanum. So this is a case of malleal fixation. As Manoj rightly said, get the normal anatomy first right. Then you've got the abnormality. You see a small calcification here going out from the malleus. This is a malleus bar. Again, there is fixation to the epitympanum. Classical ice cream cone appearance. There is no problem with the malleus of the incus. Only thing is you see a small osseous bar fixing the malleus onto the epitympanum. Fibrous dysplasias, they look ghastly on the MR. Why? Because they contain fibrous tissue. Fibrous tissue contains less water, so I am blind. My MR is blind, so how does it look? It looks dark. Only when there is hydrogen, it looks bright. If there is no hydrogen, it looks dark. Look at this. There's a large fibrous dysplasia here involving the petrus, involving the ethmoids. And in fact, this patient was deaf, and he was also blind on the right side. Blind. Why? Not just the 7th, 8th nerves being involved, the optic canal also was encroached on by fibrous dysplasia. So look beyond the temporal bone also. Small take home message. One ice cream cone appearance. Then if you have an ice cream cone, it's epitympanum. Two dots, two lines, mesotympanum, nothing, hypotympanum. The next part is look beyond the temporal bones, especially in case of fibrous dysplasia. Now, infections. Let us take the normal again. Ice cream cone appearance. Where are we? Hypotympanum? <coughs> epitympanum. Excellent. So we are in the epitympanum. And you see the joint also. Well pneumatized mastoid, well pneumatized middle ear. Pneumatized meaning air. It looks black. But look at this here. It's fully fluid. There is some soft tissue. The terminologies we use in CT are hypodensity, isodensity, hyperdensity. It's all density. So this fluid will be similar to that of the brain tissue. So it's isodense. But what has happened? As the infection progresses, the whole thing gets replaced by calcium. There is sclerosis. 
So this is a case of CSOM, chronic superative otitis media, and this is just still in the otomastoiditis stage where it has not progressed to chronicity. Now, as a sequel of this, we have cholesteatoma. We all know that this is notorious. Cholesteatomas are dangerous things. And just let us look at a few illustrations here. This is normal ice cream cone. You see the long process of the incus incudostepedial joint, very well seen. And this leads on to the oval window where the foot plate of stapes articulates. If you look at this, look at the long process here. So beautifully seen, but there is some demineralization. You don't see the normal density of the long process, which you call demineralization. So it's important as the first sign, even before you see erosion of the ossicles, erosion of the tegmen, or a labyrinthine fistula, you need to look at demineralization, which is very well seen. And these cholesteatomas, what is the common site? Pars flaccida, you see the prusac space. So where do you see the prusac space? If you take the coronal section here, you see the scutum, you see the incus, the malleus and the incus, and lateral to it, between the scutum and the bones, the incus and the malleus, is the superior tympanic recess, or also known as the prusac space. So if you see a soft tissue within the prusac space, you know you're dealing with cholesteatoma. And this patient also had erosion of the scutum. Scutum is so beautifully seen in normal cases here, but there is erosion of the scutum. And Dr. Manoj also mentioned molar tooth. Look at this. This is the reconstruction what we do. Anteriorly is the incus, posteriorly is the malleus. Is it right? Wrong. Anteriorly should be the malleus, posteriorly should be the incus. So those two give rise to a molar tooth appearance and this cholesteatoma has eroded the incus. So there is loss of molar tooth sign. You see the malleus intact but the incus is completely eroded. Now, let us look at one more illustration. This we did three days back. I think it was somewhere on 31st Jan. Again, you see the long process of the incus being eroded. The right side is absolutely normal. The right malleus is normal. The right incus is normal. But the long process of the left incus is eroded. Classical for cholesteatoma. Look at one more illustration. So now, as we go on to the Tegman erosion, this is the erosion of the tegmen here by the cholesteatoma. And you can also have a large defect within the tegmen. And this is the axis which goes intracranial. You have two areas. One is tegmen, second is the dural plate from where you can have an intracranial extension. Again, Dr. Manoj was talking about this dirty images, extremely bad images. This is a classical diffusion weighted sequence. And what happens on diffusion weighted is, when you do a diffusion weighted sequence, the cholesteatomas appear hyper intense, meaning there is a restriction of diffusion. Just one minute on the anatomy or the physics of diffusion weighted, what happens is, whenever there is fluid, say CSF, there is free movement of hydrogen protons. There is no restriction to the mobility of the hydrogen protons. But when it comes to, say, keratinous material, or caseation, what happens is it is a thick paste and there is restriction to the mobility of hydrogen protons. So once there is a restriction to the mobility of hydrogen protons, when you apply what is known as a diffusion moment of 500 or 1000, it is called B500 or B1000. We regularly use B1000, which is the standard, and that causes restriction of diffusion and you see the cholesteatoma as a bright area. So it's important for us to do a diffusion weighted sequence in all cases of cholesteatomas. Labyrinthine fistula is a complication, and Manoj beautifully brought that out. You can have a look at this, the lateral semicircular canal here. There is erosion of the lateral semicircular canal with a fistulous communication between the middle ear and the inner ear. Let's look at one more plane. This is the coronal plane again. You see loss of bone between the lateral semicircular canal and the middle ear. So beautifully brought out. The superior semicircular canal is intact. The cortical bone surrounding the superior semicircular canal is also intact. And if you look at this illustration, again, the tympanic portion of the facial nerve is eroded. 
So cholesteatomas can erode ossicles, can erode tegmen, can erode the bony covering of the labyrinth or the facial nerve.